Hello, my name is Martin Joyce and I work for the Ohio Department of Agriculture in the Division of Soil and Water Conservation. And today I'm going to be talking with you about meeting animal nutrient requirements on pasture. But before I start my presentation, I need to give some credit to folks. Um, some of the information I'm going to be sharing with you today is information that was originally prepared by members of Ohio's Integrated Forage Management Team. So let's talk about forage-based livestock production systems. As you might guess, there's lots of attributes that come to mind when we think about forage-based systems. Uh, and I've just got four listed here on the screen for you. And these are in no particular order, but number one, forage-based systems can supply the nutrients that are needed by our ruminant livestock species. They can be economically profitable. They typically are environmentally sound and they are biologically efficient biologically efficient. What exactly does that mean? Well, for instance, if we stop and think about all the soil types that we have here in Ohio, as you might guess, not all of those soils are suitable for crop production. However, and a good thing is the fact that many of them are suitable for forage production. Our forages, our green plants, through the process of photosynthesis, are able to take the sun's energy, or sunlight if you will, and water and carbon dioxide and convert those products, those things into oxygen and glucose or simple sugar. The forage plants then use the sugar and the simple carbohydrates for growth. And that growth is actually made up of complex fibrous carbohydrates, which we as humans can't digest. But fortunately, our ruminant livestock species can. Because of their four compartment stomachs, they are able to digest those carbohydrates, those things that we as humans cannot digest. And actually, if we dig a little bit deeper into the rumen of our ruminant animals, it's the microbes that live in the rumen that digest the forage. And then the animal, in turn, digests the byproducts that are produced by the microbes and the microbes themselves. And they turn that into the products that we enjoy, things like meat, milk, and fiber that we as humans are then able to utilize. And if we were to draw a picture of this process, this is kind of what it would look like. So let's talk about nutrients. There's five classes of nutrients that all livestock need. And I'm gonna walk down through those each class by class. And we'll start with water. Our livestock need water, lots of it. It needs to be clean, fresh, and available at all times. It's one of the first things that we teach a young 4-H'er if they have a livestock product. And that is the importance of water and lots of it for their livestock project. So water, number one, energy. Typically energy is commonly expressed as total digestible nutrients or TDN, if you will. In our cool season forages, which is the predominant forage base that we have here in Ohio, TDN or energy, if you will, is usually the most limited nutrient. But that's not the case with our warm season forages. Protein. Typically, it's expressed as crude protein. It normally is very abundant in our cool season forages. Um, but a side note here, it usually is one of the limiting nutrients found in warm season forages. Minerals would be the fourth class of nutrients, things like calcium, phosphorus, salt, and then our trace minerals as well. And then the fifth nutrient class is vitamins. Vitamin A, vitamin D, better known as the sunshine vitamin, vitamin E, and vitamin K. So those would be the four different vitamins. When we think about energy usage in our livestock species, we need to understand first and foremost that not all the energy that's consumed by animals is used for the purpose of growth and lactation. That energy actually gets broken down into different places or a different a hierarchy of use, if you will, 
in terms of how the energy is actually made available to our livestock species for their use. They actually lose about 60% of the energy that they consume. And that energy is lost to processes like digestion in the animal, as well as just simple maintenance of their body, of their body tissues. If we were to plot or graph out the energy usage in, a, in our livestock, this is kind of what it would look like. At the top of our, of our picture here, you can see gross energy. And then as we work our way down through the picture, we can see the different places that energy gets pulled off, if you will, and diverted towards any different thing. So for instance, you can see that 30% of the energy consumed goes towards feces, um, urine, and gases is another 10%. Our metabolizable energy, 20% uh, of that is lost to heat. So at the end of the day, we end up with about 40% of the energy that's consumed by the livestock is actually available to them for use. Priorities for nutrients. As you might guess, just like energy, our nutrient has priorities in our livestock as well. Um, and as I mentioned a little bit ago, there's actually a hierarchy um, of how that energy or those nutrients, excuse me, actually gets utilized in the livestock. So priority number one in terms of nutrient priorities is maintenance. Maintenance of the body functions of the animal. Uh, once those needs are met, then next in line would be development of the animal. Um, growth, lactation, reproduction, and then finally fattening. So what it boils down to, if our livestock species consume enough nutrients on a daily basis, then all of these processes are met and take place. But if nutrients are lacking, then not all the processes take place. And this is kind of what the hierarchy of nutrient use looks like. So again, number one, first and foremost is maintenance, followed by development, followed by growth, lactation, reproduction, and fattening. So just keep in mind that the nutrients that are consumed by our livestock, these are the different uses that those nutrients have to meet uh, within our livestock species. And again, if enough nutrients are consumed and all six can be met, then that's great. But depending on the, the nutrients that are being consumed and the quantities, then we may not be able to meet all six of those. And as a result of that, the production of the animal um, can be minimized or suffer, if you will. So what about the factors that affect our nutrient requirements. And as you might guess, there are several factors that affect the nutrient requirements of any given animal. Um, so let's walk down through these and talk about them. So number one would be the age of the animal and its stage of growth. As you might guess, our young growing animals have higher requirements than a mature animal. That's pretty common sense. And this picture kind of shows that to us uh, and begs the question, do these growing calves have higher energy and protein requirements than their moms that are already mature? And the answer to that question is yes, their nutrient requirements would be higher because they're a younger growing animal. Number two, what about the desired level of production? What level or stage of production is that animal currently in? That has a direct effect on the nutrients that are needed by that animal on a daily basis. So this chart kind of shows and depicts that for us. And this basically shows um, our estimated or our desired rate of gain is listed there on the right side of the chart. And then as we work our way across the chart, you can see how the nutrient requirements change based on our desired average daily gain. So for instance, the first line there, if we wanted our animals to gain almost three quarters of a pound per day, then you can see what the TDN requirement would be 
as well as the net energy and crude protein that are needed. And then you compare that to the last line, which is an average daily gain of a little over three pounds per day, then you can see the effect that it has on the TDN, the energy, and the crude protein requirements for an animal. And these numbers are based on a 780 pound steer. And these um, numbers come from uh, the 2000 nutrient requirements of beef cattle um, reference. Desire level of production. Again, it has a big impact on the nutrient requirements. So if we have animals that have very high energy requirements, things like lactating dairy cows or lactating ewes or nannies with twins or triplets, finishing beef animals or lambs, those would all be classes or stages of production for livestock where they would have very high energy requirements. So if we look at the next class, with which would just be high energy requirements, uh, examples of those types of animals would be beef cows that milk really well, or growing steers and heifers where we're trying to gain two pounds or more per day average daily gain. Moderate energy requirements, again, we're talking about the different levels of production here and the effect it has on nutrient requirements. So animals that would be in the moderate energy requirement class would be an average beef cow uh, or an average ewe that's only nursing a single lamb, or maybe it's steers and heifers that we're growing, but uh, our average daily gain is gonna be two pounds or less. And then uh, the next last class would be those animals which have low energy requirements. Some examples of those would be females that are dry but are pregnant. Uh, basic, they're at, they're at a maintenance stage of production. Uh, mature bulls and rams and growing animals, steers and heifers that we're trying to have them gain a pound or less per day. So those are some examples of what effect production stage has on nutrient requirements. So the third factor which affects animal requirements would be the reprodu reproductive stage. What stage of reproduction is that individual animal currently in? Um, the stage of reproduction, as you might guess, has a huge impact on that animal. Um, the highest needs would be occur right after calving or lambing. As you might guess, you know that that makes sense. So that animal has just had uh, a new calf or a new lamb. They are now lactating. So as a result of that, their nutrient needs are very high. And if you compare that to animals that would have the lowest needs, that would be example such as a beef cow where we weaned her calf or a ewe and we've weaned her lambs. So at that stage, they're no longer lactating. And as a result of that, their nutrient needs drop off considerably um, because of that. The fourth factor would be environment. As you might guess, the environment of our livestock has a big impact on the nutrient needs for those animals. For example, the winter time. As you might guess, it definitely has an impact on our livestock species, whether it's beef cows or sheep or goats or whatever the species may be. So as this picture shows and kind of depicts and reinforces, the environment can and does change the nutrient requirements of our livestock. Cold weather has an effect and hot weather has an effect on those energy requirements specifically for maintenance of that animal. This chart on the screen kind of demonstrates that. It gives an example of what effect the temperature has on our beef cattle. And it actually shows the critical temperature of our beef cattle based on different factors. So on the left side of the chart there, you can see the coat description. So we could have a beef cow, which is wearing a summer coat or a dry fall coat or a dry winter coat, 
or maybe a dry heavy winter, heavy winter coat. And then you can see the critical temperature that based on the coat of that animal, and whether it's wet or dry, see how the temperature, the critical temperature changes. And we need to understand that because that critical temperature then has a direct impact on the nutrient needs for that animal. It can either increase the nutrient needs or lower those needs. Again, we talked a little bit ago about the effect that environment has. So as this picture shows, these, these beef cows are in an environment where it looks like they're having to walk through um, lots of mud. And as a result of that, them having to fight that mud each day, walk through that mud to get to the hay feeder, that, de that actually increases the energy requirements for those cows. It can be as much as a 15% increase. So this is an example of where the environment is affecting those beef cows and it's actually raising their nutrient requirements just because of them having to fight mud each day as they make their way to the hay feeder. Some things that we can do to alleviate that, uh, to lessen the impact of the environment, if you will, is that if we're wintering our beef cows outside, which most operations do in Ohio, if we can winter those beef cows in an area where there's a hard surface, where we can minimize or reduce the amount of mud that those cows have to fight each day, as they make their way to the hay ring, then that can actually reduce uh, the amount of nutrients that they have because they're no longer having to fight and walk through lots of mud and water. So it definitely is an improvement, not only for the environment, but also for the animals from the standpoint of it actually reduces and uh, decreases the additional requirements, nutrient requirements that those animals uh, have to spend now just to feed themselves each day. And we've done that just by eliminating or reducing uh, the impact that having to walk through excess mud and water has on those beef cows. And then the fifth factor which affects animal requirements is the breed of the animal. Most profitable livestock operations have already figured this out. Um, if, if they haven't, it's something that they need to think about and pay attention to. Most of our lot profitable operations try to match the breed and the genetics of their animals to the environment and not the exact opposite. They're not trying to match the environment to the animal. It's obviously we have no control over the environment, but we do have control over the breed of livestock and the genetics that we utilize in our livestock operations. So we can serve ourselves well if we recognize that and we focus on trying to match our livestock to the environment that they have to operate and function in. A lot of operations will use breed differences. Some breeds, depending on what they are, have been shown to operate more efficiently in different types of environments. Um, genetics from breeders that have similar object, similar objectives and production systems as the system that we're gonna fake, put those livestock in when we get them back home, that definitely is something to be aware of when you're selecting livestock and bringing them into your system. Look for an operation that operates very similarly to yours. An operation where those livestock species are operating and living in similar conditions to what they're gonna live in when you get them back home to your place. Another thing that we can use is EPDs or expected progeny differences to help us select, again, those different animals um, that are, will need to function in the system that we're bringing them back home to. So using EPDs can help us pick those animals that have a better chance of being able to operate efficiently in our system once we get them back home. And then finally, select the replacements from the best animals in our system. Those are the animals that we wanna keep and utilize in our system when we're thinking about selecting replacements. 
And then the sixth factor is management. As you might guess, management definitely has an impact on our individual animals and how they function. Um, the picture that you can see here on the screen, when we take a look at that, and can we ask ourselves, and ask ourselves, do you think these animals are going to perform well? Well, at first glance, my, my answer would be no. At first glance, we can see that we've got some beef cows in a pasture here, and it doesn't look like there's any green growing forage available. Um, so as a result of that, the answer is pretty easy. You know, the answer is no. These am animals are probably not going to be able to perform well, and they're going to require some additional supplemental feed being made available to them. So management and management of our pastures directly impacts our livestock. The exact opposite is kind of shown here in this picture. Here we can see we've got some beef cows that are out on pasture. Looks like they've got adequate forage that's available to them. So again, management of the pasture has a direct impact. We want to manage our pastures in such a way that we're making adequate forage, adequate nutrients available um, to our livestock that are grazing them. So now let's talk about the factors that affect forage intake on pasture. Um, and as you might guess, and maybe you don't know, but there are several factors which affect intake, intake being how much forage our livestock species can actually consume on any given day. So if we look at some of the pasture characteristics, things like pasture mass, or how much forage is actually ava available, how much are they allowed to actually consume, how much residual forage is there uh, when we pull those grazing animals off of that pasture? What about the digestibility of the forage that's actually there that they're consuming? So those would be some pasture characteristics that we'll look at and talk about here in a moment. What about characteristics of the animal, specifically diet selection? And there are lots of fa factors that affect that. Some of them are non-nutritional and some are nutritional. Non-nutritional characteristics would be like bite size, how many bites per minute, what is the actual animal selecting to eat, some of the nutritional characteristics would be things like digestibility of the forage that they're consuming, how full is the rumen, and what metabolic processes are actually taking place. So when we think about management and management of our pasture, as we said, there's many factors which affect an animal's intake. Some of them we can control, some of them we can't. Additional options to think about uh, when we're on pasture is how much available forage is there when we turn those animals in. How much physical grass is available when the animal walks into that pasture? How big is the pasture? Is it large enough? Is the paddock that we've got them in or the pasture that they're in currently big enough to meet their needs? Is there enough forage there? How densely do we have the animals stocked in that pasture? When we talk about stocking density, we're actually talking about how many pounds of animal are on that pasture at that given time, as opposed to stocking rate. Stocking rate refers to the number of animals that are actually on the pasture, and that is different than stocking density. Stocking density is the actual number of pounds, on a given pasture at any given point in time, stocking rate is the number of animals. Those two factors do play a role and they are different. They are not the same thing. And then what about the available forage when we leave? It's super, super critical and important that when we leave our pastures, we're leaving some forage behind. We're leaving some grass behind. Um, what we typically teach to our grazers is you want to take half of the available forage and leave half of it behind when you leave the pasture. 
So the old take half, leave half um, mode of operation here is, is what we promote and really encourage our grazers to utilize. If we think about it, our livestock are kind of like government workers, and I say that in jest, obviously. But uh, what, what we really mean here is our livestock only graze a certain number of hours each day. If you ever watch your grazing animals, they're not grazing 24 hours around the clock. Part of the time during the day, they're probably laying down somewhere and they're ruminating. They're chewing their cud, if you will, and they're resting. So they don't spend 24 hours a day grazing. Depending on the species, whether it's a beef cow, a dairy cow, or a sheep, um, depending on how much time they spend grazing, and resting varies by species. So let's talk about this for a moment. So if I'm a beef cow, or you're a beef cow, then there's some things that you have to accomplish during the day. Number one, you need to actually harvest or eat enough forage in eight to nine hours, and you're doing that with a five to six inch cutter bar. And that five to six inch cutter bar is the beef cow's mouth. So that's what she has to work with. That's the equipment she's got available. Basically is her mouth, and she has to utilize that to graze and be able to eat enough forage in eight to nine hours, which is typically about the number of hours that a typical beef cow spends grazing in a 24 hour period. So that's not an easy task to start with. And that task becomes even more difficult if we've got that beef cow in a pasture where the grass is short, grass that's one to two inches in height, um, she flat out is not going to be able to eat enough forage in that eight to nine hour period if we're making her graze forages that are only one to two inches tall. Um, she just physically isn't going to be able to take in or eat enough forage to meet her daily needs. That's where the height of the forage is super critical and definitely plays and in, has an impact on how much forage that beef cow can actually take in. So forage height is super critical and to that point, forage height of anywhere from four to six inches up to about 10 inches is an optimum height for a beef cow. At that height, she's gonna be able to get a full mouth of grass every time she takes a bite and she's going to be able to be able to take in the actual amount of forage that she needs to meet her nutrient needs. So begs the question, how about the cows in this picture? We've seen this picture before. We've got these beef cows in a short grass pasture. There's nothing green and growing, lots of bare ground. It's obvious that there's very little forage available. So to the question, can these cows get enough feed off of this pasture? The answer is definitely no. They're not gonna be able to meet their needs just because there physically isn't enough forage there available for them to consume in a day's time. Forage availability, how much of it is there or how much isn't there has a direct impact on the amount of forage that they can take in. And this graph shows that. So if we look at this graph, on the left-hand axis, we can see we start at zero and we go clear up to 100%. And that's the potential amount of forage that an animal could eat. And then as we work our way across to the right, uh, the lower axis shows the amount of available forage that's there to be consumed. So what this amounts to and shows is if we have adequate forage physically available for the animal to consume, then they are able to take in and meet um, their nutrient needs. But if the forage is not there, then they simply cannot take in what they need. So at the end of the day, what we need to remember is the more forage that's available, to our livestock when they're in a pasture, then the more they can and will eat. Just as importantly, the 
composition of the sward or the pasture, if you will, the forage that's there has a direct impact also. Um, if we've got lots of forage available and it's species that the livestock uh, like, then they will eat more of it. Um, that's basically what this shows and that's really how it happens in, in real life. Um, based on the composition of the forage that's available, the livestock will more readily consume it and they will eat more of it. So if they like what's available, they'll eat more of it. Our goal as grazers and grazing managers is to try to maximize our animal intake. So basically what that amounts to is we want every bite that that animal takes, whether it's a beef cow, a dairy cow, a horse, or a sheep, we want every bite that that animal takes to be as big and as full of a bite as available. So if you look at this picture, this beef cow is grazing a pasture that's pulled down pretty tight. It's just like a carpet. And you can see by looking at this picture that there is very little available forage there for that cow to actually consume. She's having to work very hard to get any grass at all. And you can see pretty easily here that every bite she's taken is not a full bite. So at the end of the day, this cow is not going to be able to need, meet her nutrient needs just simply because the forage isn't there and available for her to eat. Digestibility, it's another factor that has a huge impact on how much forage our livestock eat in a day's time. So we need to think about that and we need to understand and ask ourselves questions like, of the forage that's available there for my livestock to utilize, how digestible is it? And that's important because as digestibility of the available forage increases, so does the intake of the animal. And that's simply what that equates to is Forages that are highly digestible, if we provide those for our livestock, then our livestock are able to eat more of them. And that's simply because as they consume that forage, because it's highly digestible, it moves faster through the rumen and through the digestion process. Because it moves faster, then it, it leaves room available for that animal to continue to eat continue to keep filling that room and with more forage. If we have forage that is not digestible or it's lower digestible, then that forage needs to spend more time in the rumen. The actual digestion process takes longer. As a result of that, that animal gets fuller quicker and she physically can't continue to eat. Um, so that's the effect that digestibility has on intake. So just remember that the more digestible the forage is, the more high quality that forage is, the more our livestock are able to eat, and the quicker it moves through the digestion process, which then allows them to continue to eat and eat more. And this slide kind of shows that. Um, it shows the length of time that different parts of the of our green plants of our forage if you will actually spins in the rumen so if we look at green leaves for instance they spend about 24 hours in the rumen and after that they've already moved through the system and if we look at green stems or dead stems those parts of the plant which be, which would be lower in digestibility than what this slide shows is it takes longer for those plant parts to go through the digestion process. Dead stems, which would equate to forage that's over mature. You can see that it takes up to 72 hours for stems to be digested compared to green leaves, which only take 24 hours. So what that means is as our forage species become more mature, the lignin percentage of the forage increases and as a result of that it increases that the digestion process of that forage 
As a result of that, our cows or our sheep or our dairy cows, if they're grazing forages that are lower in digestibility, they have a higher amount of lignin, then that increases the time needed for digestion to occur. And as a result of that, our animals are not able to continue to eat and take in the amount of forage that they need simply because there physically isn't room available in the rumen for them to continue to eat and take in forage. Some signs of this occurring, and these are easy to see in a pasture setting. Uh, this slide is, shows some, some uh, beef cattle manure would be my guess. Um, we've got some manure castles here. Those manure castles, as you can see, basically are cow pies. And what this picture shows is the shape and the size of those cow pies. Um, so they're, they're very big, they're tall. Uh, they're manure castles, if you will. So what that means is, and we, when we see this, we know that the forage that those livestock are consuming, it contains a lot of lignin. And lignin, again, is, comes from forages that are over mature, um, and as a result of that, they're not able to digest that lignin, and a lot of it passes through the animal, and it shows up in the cow pie. And what we end up with is a cow pie that's really firm, and as a result of that, when the, it makes a big, tall cow pie. As compared to uh, an animal that's grazing on highly digestible forage, um, in the springtime, for example, or early summer, when our forages are quickly growing, they're highly digestible. Um, if you've been in a pasture setting with livestock uh, during those times of the year, you'll know just by seeing the, the cow pies that are out there um, or droppings from the sheep, if it's a sheep, sheep flock, um, they look quite different. Uh, they're usually um, there'll be a lot more runny in consistency. Uh, they'll be spread out all over the ground. And that's because, of, again, of the forage that the livestock are eating. It's highly digestible. They're utilizing more of it. And as a result, less of it is going out the back end and ending up in the manure pile. So just remember that lignin equates to over mature forages, no animal can digest lignin. The only critter that can digest lignin are termites. Our livestock species are not good at, nor can they digest lignin. So some other grazing options that we have available as grazers for meeting the livestock nutrient needs of our livestock species uh, would be things in addition to summer pasture. Um, by far and away, most of our grazing operations here in Ohio rely on summer pasture. Uh, summer pasture being made up typically of our cool season grass species. But that we do have some other options as grazers that we can utilize. Uh, for instance, um, stockpiling of our grass species. And we, we can stockpile our cool season grass species. For instance, fescue works very well for stockpiling. We can stockpile the growth of our fescue beginning in late August. We can set those pastures aside and let that pasture grow with the full intent of grazing that stockpiled pasture, if you will, later in the fall and early winter. So that can provide an option where we can extend the grazing season, push it further into the fall, even into the early winter, especially if we're stockpiling tall fescue, which works really well for stockpiling. We can use the stockpiling option um, as a grazing option for us that we can utilize um, in the fall and early winter. So this would be one thing that we can do to extend the grazing season. Another option that's available to us as grazers is um, utilizing crop residues, corn stalks for instance. 
So if you've got a grazing option, uh, operation and you have access to corn stalks um, for beef cattle, this works really well and provides a great option here again to extend our grazing season during the fall. Um, we can utilize corn stalks and while we're doing that, we're giving our cool season pastures a chance to rest. And by allowing those pastures to rest, we can stockpile that forage and then utilize it later in the fall or early winter after we pull the cows off of the corn stalks. So crop residues, um, again, if you're in an area where they're readily available, this works really good to extend that fall grazing season. It's a real cheap source of forage for our animals and for dry beef cows, cows that have been, we've weaned the calves off of and they're just in that second trimester. So they're basically, all they gotta do is meet their maintenance needs each day. Um, grazing corn stalks works extremely well. So, Couple of things to think about as we close out the presentation here. When we think about meeting our animals' nutrient requirements, we need to remember some of the principles that Andre Boysen teaches and highlighted in his work. And if you don't know who Andre Boysen was, he really is the father of rotational grazing, more specifically of intention of uh, intensive grazing management. Um, and Boysen taught us that we always need to remember when we're managing our pastures, when we're managing our forages for our grazing animals, all we're trying to do and really trying to meet is match the, our forage plants need for rest between harvest with our animals need for high quality feed. So what this depicts and reinforces is how important the rest period is for our forages. We always wanna provide adequate rest, give our pasture plants a chance to regrow before we turn the livestock back in on those forages to be consumed. So, for more information regarding grazing and grazing management, there's lots of different options out there for folks to reach out to and get additional information if you need it. I've got it listed there on the slide for you. Uh, most counties have an OSU Extension Office. There's also typically a Soil and Water Conservation District Office in all 88 counties. So we have SWCD staff, and NRCS staff many times in those soil and water offices that are available to provide assistance um, to our grazers if you need additional information on grazing management. And then one other source is Ohio State University's Forages website. Um, you can go there. I've got the website listed there in the slide. There's lots of different resources available um, for managing forages, for managing grazing operations available there on the website as well. So with that, that concludes my presentation. Um, thank you for tuning in today and I hope this has been helpful for you.